Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this very special webinar, Protecting Our Legacy Trees, uh, in aid of launching our new report. My name is Shannon, and I have the pleasure of introducing this session and hosting our question time at the end. So these forests, um, as per the background um, of all of your um, speakers tonight, um, are usually not the forests I spend a lot of time in. Usually it's underwater in the kelp forest, but I'm really excited to explore this session tonight and how and why we can care for our large trees, old and the next, genera next generation of land dwelling trees. So to start with, um, we as the Victorian National Parks Association acknowledge the many first peoples of the area now known as Victoria and honour their continuing connection to caring for country. We offer our respects to elders past, present and future. So if you are new to VMPA, welcome. And if you've already been in our community, welcome back. Um, for those of you who don't know, we are an effective and influential nature conservation organisation. We've led the creation, oversight and defence of Victoria's natural estate for over 70 years. That's all accomplished by working with local communities, scientists and government to advocate for evidence-based policy to safeguard wildlife, habitats and protected areas. We also inspire connections with nature through citizen science activities, uh, action and education for all of Victorians. So this evening, uh, you will very shortly hear from uh, Jordan Crook, our VMPA's Parks and Nature campaigner, who has a wealth of experience and knowledge, so you're definitely in for a treat. Um, and uh, he will introduce the Living Legacies report, why we wrote it and why we want to see it used. Um, unfortunately, James uh, Shug is unwell and is no longer able to be with us, but on the upside, we um, might wrap it up a little earlier to allow everyone to have time to have their dinner or allow extra time with Jordan. Um, so Jordan's work uh, ranges from uh, the ocean to the tall forests of the central highlands. He has an academic and vocational background in conservation and land management uh, a boriculture training and assessment. And if he was a Victorian native tree, he would probably be a yellow box. So this session is a webinar, which means you can see and hear us, but we can't uh, hear or see you, um, and neither can the other participants that are on the call. So Jordan very shortly will be speaking for around 25 minutes and at the end uh, of his session we will address any of your questions you might have. So uh, definitely as Jordan's speaking feel free to pop any questions in the Q&A function which is the Q&A symbol towards the bottom of your screen. It's next to the chat function um, as well. So yeah so any questions feel free to pop them in and we'll answer them at the end. And uh, that session will be around 10 to 15 minutes long. So everyone, welcome, uh, sit back, relax and enjoy and take in some of Jordan's wisdom that he'll be sharing with you. And let's explore how we can keep big, old, hollow bearing trees in the forest and across our shared landscape. So Jordy, over to you. Thank you, Shannon. And uh, thank you to everyone for coming along tonight. I just want to acknowledge that I'm coming to you all from Warrenjeri country, uh, part of the Kulin Nation. Pay my respect to their elders, past and present. Um, this report's taken a bit of time uh, to put together, not as long as it's taken this tree here to grow. This is the Yaling giant um, from the Talangi Forest. Uh, can fit 40 people inside of it. It's also home to a range of bats and there's lead bed as possum living around the corner from it. So just another living example of how important these large and old trees are. Um, so before I joined the VMPA, um, I was an arborist. Um, and a lot of the time, as you can see by the pictures, that involved removing trees, um, but also doing some good stuff like putting up nest boxes. Um, I came to being an arborist uh, through labouring for a company and understanding how trees are managed in the urban landscape, amenity trees, and then wanting to pursue that further by getting a qualification and becoming a qualified arborist. Um, arboriculture, which is the, the science that uh, arborists implement 
is the care and management of amenity trees. And amenity trees can be quite a lot of things, um, mostly where we see them and where we gain that amenity and um, how they're used across urban um, farming landscapes as well as natural area landscapes. So next slide, thanks. So to a lot of us, this question uh, can get pretty deep, it can get spiritual, it can get scientific, um, and to different communities, trees mean different things. But um, when it's plain and simple, trees matter. They matter quite a lot. Um, their habitat, their shade, they store carbon, they um, photosynthesize these amazing um there's amazing things that trees can do photosynthesize and transpiration they take in what we breathe out and give us fresh breath and they transpire and create the water for us and they're quite amazing and then there's the cultural uh, importance for first nations communities and the communities all around the world about these living monuments in time you can walk past the same tree and it'll almost look the same as when your great great grandparents walked past it. Trees are very long lived organisms, but they can only be long lived if we look after them. And the longer we look after them, the longer we get these values uh, given to us. And to do that, we've got to look after them. The next slide. So, coming from um, an arborist background, um, I worked on quite a lot of state government projects, all the rail projects going through the city and through the state at the moment. I worked on quite a lot of them and um, I've I seen a higher level of, of care and management of uh, urban trees, elms on St Kilda Road to um, a two, three-year-old uh, flowering gum in Camberwell than um, currently is being seen across public lands. And that's where this report kind of came from, trying to incorporate um, Australian standards and arboricultural knowledge, as well as science from um, ecologists and, and um, horticulturalists to better care for these big trees. And what we're finding um, with my role at the VMPA is there's three main areas that are heavily impacting large and old trees across the public land estate. So that's fire management operations, um, these horrendous fuel breaks that are getting put in, as well as uh, fire operations, native forest logging and logging-like operations. So native forest logging has stopped to an extent across public land but it seems to be persisting on private land and operations that are very indistinguishable from logging operations across parks and state forests, such as what's happening in the wombat forests. And then there's general poor management um, and poor planning um, that you see across all land tenures, um, but can be remediated by using uh, standards and increasing knowledge of how trees work. So next slide. So this is one of the examples of um, native forest logging, not necessarily ending earlier this year, like it was promised. This is a uh, storm cleanup and fuel break operation in the Lyric Barring Nature Conservation Reserve um, in the Wrights Forest section near Cockatoo. Um, these images were taken not that long ago to go in and remove these trees after storm events is going to compromise not just the next generation of um, trees and, and native plants recovering, but also compromise trees that weren't um, pushed over by the storms. So next slide. This is a, an example of poor management and um, it is a poor understanding of tree physiology. Um, this reseeding ash forest uh, project is um, collecting ash seeds, so trees from ash um, eucalypt species, um, 
but it's from it's removing 50 percent of the crown of the tree and that goes against all good arboricultural knowledge or um, understanding of tree physiology um, we know you don't take more than a third of a tree off at a time to allow it to recover from that impact and that's all within the australian standard for pruning amenity trees so next one um compaction and and damaging of um trees creates future hazards so this um this fuel break um in the dandenong ranges you'll see quite a lot from the dandenong ranges place close to my heart um and quite a lot of dodgy things going on at the moment so this operation was to widen an existing fuel break um as well as um, removing some uh, so-called hazardous trees. Uh, but in this process, uh, next slide, uh, they're creating more hazardous trees. As you can see, every one of these trees has been bumped into by a heavy machine. Um, the roots driven over by 40, 50 tonne machines in an area that uh, those trees haven't uh, copped that kind of damage in the past. So uh, looking at this from an arborist, this is not just terrible practice. Um, all those trees are likely to be hazardous. Their roots have probably been broken under the ground, not just by the weight of the 40, 50 ton machines, but also from the bumping into them and the roots um, snapping. So we're doing these operations apparently to increase the safety of, of folks um, in the park, in the forest. Um, but as we can see here as a living example, we're actually increasing future hazards. Um, trees take a long time to die, particularly eucalypt trees. So these trees might persist for a, a few more years, um, but they, they will die from these um, impacts by forest fire management. Next one. So two ways, um, the image of the bad pruning cut and the intrusion into the tree protection zone of the large mountain grey gum in the wombat forest. Um, again, two living examples of uh, practices that can change and can change by using a st standards that can be uh, set across the whole state. So next one. And I guess the main thing uh, to get through to everyone and, and to get through to uh, public land management uh, managers is poor management leads to tree death and loss, and it creates future hazards. So this is a, a G-bung, a forest G-bung, uh, found by the team at uh, Watch Wildlife of the Central Highlands and the uh, Victorian Forest Alliance. Um, in an area that was being regenerated by Deca and Vic Forest after it failed to grow. These trees were likely many hundreds of years old and they've been damaged by poor practice working within their tree protection zone and they've compromised these trees. A river red gum, Eucalyptus camalgulensis, can have something like this done, the heavy machine rolling over its roots the cutting and severing of its roots, the bumping into, but not show signs of that and not die for another 30, 40 years. So the impacts that we have and the short turnarounds in compliance of looking at the trees and going, nope, they're okay, they're still alive, lucky. If you come back in five years, 10 years, 20 years, those trees will have likely died from that operation. So next slide. So poor tree care and management can be avoided with good practice. This is a beautiful standing um, tree G-bung, luckily still standing because of the great work of um, local conservationists and Warburton environment. And this is a, a three to 500 year old tree, even though it doesn't stand that tall, probably at about 10 to 15 meters. So, um, the size of a tree doesn't necessarily um, dictate its age, particularly with these smaller species. The tree 
growing to its left is probably a big towering mountain ash, um, 50, 60 metres tall. Could be younger than this forest um, G-bung living next door to it. Right, next one. So that's where the idea of this um, log of claims has come from for large and old trees using evidence, Australian standards, and a focus on tree health and protection. If we're to bring these uh, trees into the next generation and hand them on as living legacies, um, we must do better at, at looking after them. And we know how to do that. The evidence is there. We just need to implement these changes. We have the tools. We need to take them off the shelf and start using them. So next one. So this is a, an example of uh, an operation planned by Forest Fire Management Victoria um, that hopefully quite a few of you have heard of, um, this log extraction operation that's being planned by Forest Fire Management. The photo that you can see is an image of one of the sites where the logs are to be extracted under the guise of fire management. The um, BMPA and the local land care group have been working tirelessly for two years to get a better result uh, for these forests and to get a better result for the, the trees and the tree ferns left standing after the storms. Um, unfortunately, that's not um, resulting in changes on the ground. Unfortunately, it has seen a reduction of the area from 100 hectares to 50, which is quite a, um, a good step. But we're seeing poor survey work um, done by the department and poor tree protection zones being put into place. So five metre tree protection zone will still see tree roots broken and, and damaged. So next slide. The use of heavy machinery off track into undisturbed areas, not to the standards and I think these a tree planted in an urban environment, say like the one on your nature strip, it has grown up with that disturbance and that compaction of soil. These trees have grown in a forest with um, an ecosystem around it and it's not used to such heavy force being placed on its roots and it's um, within its tree protection area. So again, heavy machinery being rolled around here a year after an assessment might be done, if any, and the trees are still green and alive, come back 10, 15, 20 years later, a lot of these trees may have fallen over and all died in that time. Not to mention the ecological um, impact of uh, disturbing an already disturbed and recovering ecosystem. The next generation of trees uh, will be rolled over and crushed um, by heavy machinery going off track. So next slide. So this is um, just being released now, these images. We got, um, we got these maps back from um, DECA after waiting 18 months through a freedom of information request. Um, and as you can see, the image um, showing lots of trees um, lots of little green trees in the proposed log extraction area um, is from the VMPA and the Southern Dandenong's Land Care Group have surveyed through that area. And it's almost 100 to 1 in terms of you look at the other map and there's, there's about six significant trees uh, found within the, the planned work area. Um, so next slide. And this is the other area for planned log extraction uh, by forest fire management. So the, um, the assessment process by the department has been lacking at the very least. And these trees that have survived um, the storm event in 2021 will be compromised and quite a lot of them within a park if these operations are to go ahead. Um, this poor survey work is truly unacceptable when volunteers and community groups can do such a thorough job 
and and um, fully document each and every one of those trees collected by the VMPA and, and the Southern Dandenongs group um, has an individual photo, an example of a, a hollow or a significant DBH, uh, which is a diameter of, of the tree. And all the department can come up with is a handful of trees is, is very disappointing and shows that there is possibly a, a culture of um, not caring or understanding the significance of large and old trees on public land. So next slide. And what we fear um, with this operation planned in the Dandenongs is across the fence. Um, this operation was conducted in about 2021 to 22 uh, by Melbourne Water. This is the Sylvan Reservoir um, just across from the Dandenong Ranges National Park, quite clearly a logging-like operation where the logs are being taken out, but the slash and everything's being left. Uh, next slide. And there's no doubt that this operation, using the hard, heavy machinery off track into these natural areas, has likely compromised the remaining and recovering trees. Goes against the Australian standard. None of those trees have tree protection zones and no effort made to... Um, to put them in either. So if this is what's planned for the Dandenong Ranges, we'll see an uptick in, in tree loss and loss of those large and old trees that were mapped by the VMPA and the land care group and, and lost in an ecosystem that uh, is home to species such as Australia's largest owl, the powerful owl, and the second largest gliding mammal in the world, the greater glider. So these operations are very disappointing and don't don't uh, sit well with the ban on native forest logging. So next slide. Um, they're also losing social license, um, as you can see from this banner um, from Kitan the other day. Um, they don't sit well with the science. Um, the rapid loss of hollow bearing trees is increasing. It also doesn't sit well with the legislation such as within the Flora and Fauna Guarantee Act that says large and old hollow bearing trees should be protected. We know how to protect them and that's with the Australian standard. Letting machines come within five metres of trees is going to compromise them into the future and likely kill them. So next slide. So taking... All these examples, these terrible uh, gut-wrenching examples for an arborist um, and everything that I've learned from the urban environment and everything that I've seen done on other state government projects and other state government land closer to the city, um, I had to do something. And luckily, with the support of the VMPA, they allowed me to put my... Uh, a boricultural hat on um, and try and push for a better way of, of looking after our large and old trees. And that's come down to a, a log of claims, um, one of these beautiful mountain grey gums in the Mervyn North Regional Park here. So next slide, please. So a log of claims uh, lays out improvements and, and changes needed. Um, the log of claims is a, is a union uh, kind of document and um, I guess we're kind of acting a little bit as the union for large old trees at the moment and with us all together we can do that. Um, the the logger claims we're putting forward are changes that need to be accepted um, by all public land managers we hope um, and it's based on evidence, it's based on Australian standards and if we're serious about protecting large and old trees into the future. These really are the bare minimum of what we can do. So next slide, thanks. So I've picked out a few. There's 21 um, examples of what public land managers can do to reduce um, the loss of large and hollow bearing trees, as well as um, keeping people safe. So as an arborist, that's 99% of your job, managing trees to keep people safe. 
Um, and this is a good example. We're seeing across every land tenure, national park, conservation reserve, um, large old and hollow bearing trees being felled because they're assessed as being hazardous through very questionable uh, tree hazard risk assessments. But a tree is only really a hazard when it has a target to injure or hurt. And this, um, this idea was thought of by uh, a few arborists and a, a few ecologists, and we've put it in the document. If no one goes under the, the uh, assessed hazardous tree or within the drip line or the, uh, the estimated fall area of that tree, the risk is reduced thoroughly. So particularly during operations um, for so-called um, prescribed and, and fuel reduction works, um, it reduces the threat for those people working in and around those trees. So an exclusion zone stops someone going in there. So it stops um, the chance and possibility of those people being injured if that tree was to fail. So next slide, thanks. This is another example um, of what's going on overseas. Um, and this uh, good practice here being undertaken by the National Park Service in the United States. This is General Sherman one of the largest and tallest trees on earth. Um, and this uh, fire retardant uh, aluminium foil is, is placed around large and old trees um, in, the, in the United States ahead of the fire front. We're proposing that can also be done uh, to protect large and old trees during uh, prescribed fire operations as well. Uh, large and old trees take 120 to 220 years old to form. The least we can do is wrap them in foil to protect them from um, these operations, these prescribed fire operations. And if possible, if we move forward, we can start also doing it ahead of um, bushfire operations. So we already do this with historic huts. Um, across the parks estate and public land estate. They're wrapped in the uh, fire retardant foil. Um, if we can do it for the huts that can be rebuilt, essentially, we can do it for these large old trees that once they're gone and they've fallen over and the fires engulf them through prescribed fire operations or in bushfire situations, why can't we do it for large old trees? we're not asking much here so next slide so the use of um australian standards so 4970 2009 um, tree protection zones you'll see them a lot in the suburbs if the council's designated a tree to be um, kept on a site while a house or a development's being built you'll see hard barriers put up and um, the calculation of um, 12 times the dbh of the tree is used using this australian standard and that reduces the impact of the development on the tree reduces creating future hazards and it's very easy to implement it's very easy to implement it's all within the australian standard it's all very easy to calculate and exclude heavy machinery developments new paths etc around these large old and significant trees. The tools are there, we just need to use them. Next slide. And I've had this debate um, with quite a few um, land managers trying to get them to understand these tools exist. Um, and they've gone and they've looked at the Australian standards and, and they've said they don't, um, they don't uh, include public land or forests or national parks. And um, in my opinion and in the opinion of uh, other arborists I've spoken to, that's incorrect. Um, the application is across anywhere a tree or development is happening and using the definition of development, the carrying out of works, roadworks, or any other act or matter defined by the re relevant legislation, whether it's prescribed burning operations, whether it's fuel break widening operations, road widening operations, 
putting in of, of new huts or campsites, they all meet the definition of development within the Australian standards. So the Australian standard for tree protection should be being applied across the public land estate where it currently isn't. So next step. Another Australian standard um, that is used very heavily um, by local government as well as on state government um, development sites for rail lines and, and, and roads and the like closer to Melbourne is the, um, excuse me, the pruning of amenity trees, Australian standard. You prune a tree the wrong way, it allows the tree, it, the fungi and disease will enter the tree and the tree won't be able to recover and seal over that wound. So um, trees don't heal once a cut is made on the trunk. The tree will start putting up walls or this um, this thing called coated um, compartmentalization of decaying trees. If we prune a tree the wrong way, that decay is going to get in quicker and the tree won't be able to seal it off quick enough to stop further rot from happening. If we prune to branch collars and we prune properly, the tree will be able to seal over those wounds and limit the impact of decay in that tree. Again, it's a standard, it's out there. It could be being used and it should be being used across the public land estate. You don't need an arborist to, to do a cut to Australian standard. Anyone can do it. The standard's there. We, we must start implementing them. So next slide. And two big... Um, Loopholes in protecting large and old trees. This was a stump that I met many years ago in New G on Gunai Kurnai country that used to be home to a family of greater gliders. We have um, a, a ban on native forest logging on, on private land, on um, public land, but not on private land. A loophole the size of a logging truck. Um, and there really needs to be, if we're serious to protect, protecting large and old trees and growing the next generation of large and old trees. We need to legislate the ban on native uh, forest logging across all land tenures, public and private. Next slide. And what are the, this operation here is from the Sylvan water catchment. To me, that looks like a logging operation to to my understanding, it meets the definition of a uh, timber harvesting operation as per the Sustainable Timber Act, um, but it's it's being done under the guise of, of fire management where logs, even though they're the least flammable part of an ecosystem, they're being removed. Um, this is a very large and heavy uh, machine here, 40, 50 tonne, possibly more, um, being rolled around under, you can see behind it, a large hollow bearing tree and a significant tree at that. So we're seeing these operations being done. Forest fire management regulate themselves. So they mark their own homework, essentially. And what we need is greater transparency over these projects and them to be regulated to reduce the impact on large and hollow bearing trees. And by doing that, reducing the impact on threatened species who rely on these large and hollow bearing trees. So next slide, thanks. Um, so thank you. This is one of my favorite trees um, in, I think it's in uh, Wesburn. It's a monthy old uh, swamp gum growing in a paddock. And as you can see, even though it's old and half of it's fallen over and gone, it's still home to quite a lot of um, native wildlife. It's still storing carbon. It's still photosynthesizing and it's still uh, creating water. So uh, please uh, jump online and, and read the report. Any feedback is welcome always. Um, check out the 21 recommendations. Um, and please um, use the report to go forward and, and advocate for 
large and old trees in your patch, um, use the evidence in the Australian standards and undertake this action, scan it on the QR code or, or look on the VMPA website or social media for elected leaders to adopt these um, 21 recommendations in the logger claims to better look after our large old trees and protect important critters such as this king parrot in doing that. Uh, next slide. So yeah, um, yeah. Do you want to jump in, Shan? I think you're up. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jordy, for your passion. It's very inspiring. Um, so obviously Jordan's done a whole bunch of amazing work here. Um, and you know, this has um, an impact so far, but um we really do need help to make sure that the report has the most impacts that it can going forward. Um and because VMPA is an independent organisation and relies on the generous support of people like you to keep our campaigns and advocacy going. So please consider donating to help us continue this important work and to ensure that our incredible trees are protected by visiting our website or scanning the QR code on the screen. So this is the part of the evening where we move into our Q&A section. So just a reminder, if anyone's got some questions um, remember, no question is a silly question, so feel free to pop it in the chat. Um, and we've got a couple for you, Geordie, at the moment. So we've got one from Richard, and Richard's asking, whereabouts in the Dandenongs can we see this destruction? That is what's, um, that is what's the best spot to visit. Thanks. Uh, yep. I don't know if the slide's still up, but that last slide had an absolute tree champion, Jill Redwood, in it. And I think need to acknowledge her um, as a as a legend and protector of large old trees. Just before I go on there, um, and thank Jill for all her work. Um, and yeah, answering Richard's question, um, luckily um, those operations haven't started yet uh, in the Alinda and Sylvan area, um, the area where I showed where we've surveyed. Um, the we believe the work could start any time um, but again it's just a decision the fuel break work and the that logging operation within the sylvan catchment is actually behind um, a fence the general public can't fully get to it um, a concerned member of the public leaked us those images um, those drone images or airplane images or wherever they came from um, that showed the logging up to the water's edge. We can't see that. That's managed by Melbourne Water. The fuel break operation spans between the park um, and the, the Melbourne Water land. So, um, yeah, happy to show you where it is and where those uh, trees were damaged. I can send people some GPS points and where to go, but it's in the Sylvan kind of area of the park down the back. Great, thanks, Geordie. Another one for you. Um, this is by John. John's got, um, thank you, John, for your commentary here. Um, one of John's question is, what are the results of poor forest management on top of runaway global warming? Yeah, I guess uh, forest management is um, a bit of a silver cultural term. Um, and it's, it's well, we're all paying the price for it here in Victoria and, um, Silver culturalists is a term, another term for loggers or native forest loggers. And it's been a, a failed experiment in Victoria. Our forests are more uh, prone to fire and higher severity fire. They produce less water in water catchments and the list of um, native wildlife going on to threatened species list continues to grow. So um, forest management probably the wrong term we need to start looking at ecosystem management looking after all those values um, through a non-silver cultural uh, lens and more of one where we uh, custodians and uh, carers of those landscapes for all the species in them not just the trees um, with the future hope of ripping them out for wood Great. And um, there's a couple of questions from two different 
And so we're going to try and address these in one, Jordan. So uh, who has copies of the report being given to and is there hard copies available? And if so, how much? Uh, yep. So we have sent the um, this new report. Uh, it's only been officially released right now. Um, but we have sent it to the um, Environment Minister, Steve Dimopoulos. Um, it will also be given to the head of um, the Environment Department and the Chief Fire Officer as well. Um, there are hard copies available. Um, so, yeah, feel free to shoot me an email or, or shoot the VMPA uh, contact um, through the uh, website uh, email and um, we'll get one out to you. There's not many, though, not many hard copies. And we have one from Dale, um, so who's um, mentioning that this session is about significant trees. So how does the tree protection zone work in a forest considering trees are interconnected, i.e. many trees may need protecting? That's exactly right. Um, as you could see uh, in our mapping in the Dandenongs, there's big clusters of um, significant large and old trees together. And what you would do is you would calculate the tree protection zone and where they meet together, that becomes a larger tree protection zone. So um, excluding machinery into those areas um, is, is what would happen. So you calculate the, the DBH of the tree and, and use that to create the tree protection zone. And if that tree protection zone meets up with a nearby tree, then that becomes one larger tree protection zone. So um, the standard is written to, to look after trees, just one tree. We're moving to a forest. We're talking about an, an ecosystem. So there's different, um, different uh, things to be brought in. Um, if you read the report, you'll see like large trees, um, such as large mountain ash, eucalyptus regnans, uh, very susceptible to changes in hydrology and, and compaction. And it's recommended that they get a 100 metre buffer. So go beyond the Australian standard um, to, to give them a larger buffer zone. So it's all place-based. Um, but the Australian standard can set out a, a uh, framework that can be used to try and avoid and minimise that impact on, on trees. Great, Geordie. We've got another one from Helen who's saying that um, Cardinia Park in Geelong on footy match days, people park all around and under the trees, including gums. Are cars causing damage and should we be lobbying the council to stop this? It would. Um, so, yeah, beautiful part of the world. Um, the trees, if they were planted, have located have likely grown up with that impact and that compaction around their roots. Um, protection zones around to allow them to, um, to gain better health and, and vigour would help, um, but they've likely grown up with that impact. If they're remnant trees that were there prior to colonisation, then I think there's definitely an ask there to better protect them by bringing in tree protection zones or even going a bit further, mulching their roots, planting the understory back under them. But if they're amenity trees that have been planted and they've grown up with that impact of um, the compaction from the cars, they're likely already adapted to those changes. Cool. Thanks for that question, um, Helen. And we've got another one uh, from Ewan. How does Melbourne Water justify logging in their water catchment given the impact of logging on water yield? Um, there, there'll be more to come um, if we can uh, if we can get around to it. it. It, in my opinion, it's quite a dodgy operation. Um, we had a big FOI that's come in, and the calculation of fire risk was questionable, um, and it was quite clearly a, a log grab for a timber industry that was um, failing and, and running out of wood at the time. So um, hopefully if we um, 
release some more stuff into the future, but I would, um, those photos are on the um, BNPA Twitter and on, on their website. Feel free to use those images and go and ask Melbourne Water that because we keep asking them that and a different answer for every different person you talk to. Okay, so we've got another one. Hopefully I'm saying, is it JR? Sorry, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Um, but um, JR says, thanks for your hard work, Jordan. Compliance with standards is essential for all state government bodies. From my experience, public land managers on public crown land often operate without consulting standards and even local government significant tree registers. I've seen so many 100-year-old-plus trees damaged, taken more than 30% of canopy. When challenged on these poor practices, which even breach their own policies, they default to the clause the minister can override the policy breach. This is so disappointing. Have you come across this and suggestions on how to challenge this behaviour? Yeah, continually. And I guess um, it's just education, 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 really. Um, and and advocacy um, from people such as yourself. Um, the standards are there. They work. They're easy to implement. Um, they should be implemented. Take the action from before or on the website, and and you can use the same wording from that letter um, to send to your local councils as well. So um, it's education. It's understanding that these are long lived organisms. If we want them to be long-lived organisms, we need to look after their health, um, and that that means um, sticking by those two standards and implementing practices that um, maintain those standards and maintain the health of those trees. Another really good question from Anonymous, uh, Jordan, is are these timber salvage operations commercial operations? I'm a bit confused because I thought... Commercial harvesting uh, wasn't allowed in national parks and nature conservation reserves. Yes, correct. Absolutely. Um, the one plan for the Dandenong Ranges uh, very much has a commercial um, element where the trees are being removed for the highest and best use uh, for a contract written between Vic Forest and Forest Fire Management. And it very much seems to be the tail wagging the dog that it's we've got to get the logs out to make the operation viable monetarily um, while um, outcomes ecologically and, and otherwise are, are dropped. So, um, yes, if you read the National Parks Act and the regulations for you or I to go into a park um, and take a log out or a plant or a leaf or a twig, um, we would get in trouble. But forest fire management... Uh, using these questionable sections um, of fire management um, legislation to to do these operations. So yes, you're right, and we've been putting that case forward since 2021 when the storms have happened. We've held them off till now. We've um, made a big fuss about it. Um, we've got some. We've got a certain way, but um, we haven't got all the way there. So um, the same goes for the wombat forest and the cobors, um, as well as these new operations in Wright Forest in the Lyric Barring uh, Conservation Reserve. There's a commercial incentive here to remove these logs because they are the least flammable section of the tree. So it's um, disappointing um, and setting very dangerous precedents for care and management of our forest and woodland ecosystems. Uh, a few more for you, Jordan, that keep coming through. So thanks, everyone. Uh, Janine's asking about mapping of Western Port woodlands. Yep, there's quite a uh, quite a few large old trees through there, luckily. Um, and, yes, we work very closely with the Save Western Port Woodlands group um, and the uh, South Gippsland Conservation Society. Um, and, yeah, we're, we're working our way through finding some of those large old trees to map them and, and, and protect them, not just from public land management um, managers, but also uh, possible sand mining operations as well. 
Great. Um, and Karen's asking, what does the local Labor MP Monbolk say about this destruction and any recommendations that you have about lobbying of other MPs? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So we've got quite a lot of information up on the um, the MPA website about what's happening in the Dandenongs. Um, the local land care group and, and um, myself personally have reached out and no luck getting a meeting or a conversation um, with that MP. Um, hopefully that changes. Um, if these operations go ahead, they're going to scar the Dandenongs for for decades so um yeah there's quite a lot of information and maps and uh, reports on the vmpa website and if you can't find them um just shoot us an email and and we can put it all together for you and and help you approach that um politician thanks jordan ben is asking do trees on the significant tree register require a tpz so the significant tree register um, is is done by the National Trust, so another not for profit. Um, it doesn't actually have a statutory protection or legislation to protect those trees. It's just relying on the goodwill of council and and public land managers or, or developers. So um, a lot of the time, if those trees are going to be impacted by something, they will consult with the significant tree. Uh, register committee um, but it still relies on people's goodwill rather than a legislative uh, framework of protection so it's very uh, disappointing in that way. Uh, John has a question um, and a statement um, so well done on your work Jordan I was traveling down the western highway yesterday and noticed that there were a number of large trees on the ground in an area where there had been a fuel reduction burn. Had these been felled as a hazardous as hazardous after the burn or were they killed by the burn itself or a combo of both? It's very much likely a combo of both. That's what we're seeing across um, a lot of the parks, um, reserves and state forests and the like. So trees are, are felled prior to a burn being undertaken and, um, or they're not protected sufficiently during the actual burning operation and thus being consumed and lost. So most likely both. And as you can see, we've got the tools to, to reduce that impact. So we should use them. Great. A uh, couple more, Jordan. Um, yeah. Vicky uh, is saying that we are facing these issues in Merbu North now post-storm. February 2024, we are being denied access to key large tree sites because of the safety issues with exclusion zones being developed. Any suggestions on how to proceed right now to ensure our older trees are being protected from practices you are talking about? Um, you could use the new report and give that to the land managers who are, um, who are planning those works remind them of their legislative duties to protect large and hollow bearing trees and the habitat of um, threatened species. So um, keep advocating, obviously get in touch um, if you want further help. Um, we went up to Merbin North and, and, and spent time with um, the community up there after those storm impacts um, and going in and retrieving logs and, and branches and the like with heavy machinery will cause further damage to trees in um, the urban setting, the farming setting and um, in the natural bushland area. So yes, keep keep pushing for, for better standards. We've got the standards, let's use them. Um, Kate is looking to make an impact right now, I think in half an hour's time. Um, she would like to know what you'd like her to ask um, the Monbolk MP at the Emerald Village Association meeting, 7.30 tonight, discussing local storms. Winky face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there's there's a lot on the VMPA website. Maybe ask her to, to meet with us, the VMPA and the Southern Dandenongs Land Care Group. Um, to hear our concerns and the concerns of local experts on lyrebirds and greater gliders of these um, 
operations that are just they, they will scar the dandenongs if if they go ahead and they're not warranted. And thank you for speaking up. Yes, thanks, Kate. Um, Ray is just pointing out, um, think about a Central Highlands um, sub, uh, open submission on Engage Victoria, Jordan, I think. Yep. Central yeah, Highlands so that, yep. yeah, that, that, that uh, went up last week, I think. Um, and you'll be hearing a bit more through the BMPA communications about um, jumping on and doing that and advocating for the creation of the Great Forest National Park. The evidence and the science is there and the community will is, is as well. But there's now this prolonged um, process which we have to keep going through to get there. So the science is very clear. Um, we need the Great Forest National Park and if we want it, this is the process we need to um, put into to get that outcome and pass those those forests over to future generations and those large old trees, which is on the front of the report, um, is, is in those forests. So, yeah, jump on and, and say, um, we want the Great Forest National Park. The science is there. Let's do it. Uh, okay, Jordan, I think this is the last one or two. Um, Mick is asking, any particular area of focus help required in the Greater Bendigo area? Yeah, absolutely. Greater Bendigo has got quite a few issues. Um, we were out there a few weeks ago as well um, with the BDEC group. Um, lots of illegal mountain bike tracks impacting large and old trees as well as heritage sites. Um, but to get an old box or ironbark tree in those landscapes is very rare. Um, so if you've got large, old, hollow-bearing um, ironbark or box trees, um, record them document them um, any way you can with cancel or the significant um, trees list um, because they are a dime a dozen out there. Excellent. Okay. So, Jordan, how are you feeling? Do you want one more? Yeah, one more and then I'll, I'll pass on um, James's uh, apologies. Great. Okay. So um, there was one from an anonymous, which is how old are your favourite legacy trees estimated to be? Decades slash centuries? Question mark. Yeah, absolutely. Australia is not that old uh, in terms of the concept of what Australia is um, pre-European. So um, even that those little G-bung trees are probably one of my favourite, the tree G-bungs. They can be very small and small diameter, but they they probably predate even Captain Cook's great-grandfather being born. So they've these, these very much living legacies. Um, or the tree on the front of the report as well is probably one of my favourites, um, just because I've, I've been there when we fit, 40 people inside of it and we probably could have fitted more we ran out of people we didn't run out of space so um yeah it's hard to pick a favorite that's like picking a favorite child yeah, you're not supposed to do it are you no <laughs> all right well um for anyone else that didn't um get we didn't get to answer your questions please feel free to email us at uh, vmpa at vmpa.org.au um, and that will be passed on to Jordan um, and then we can try and answer any more of your questions. Um, just before we wrap up, Jordan, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, I just wanted to um, pass on James, who was also meant to be one of the speakers today. His apologies for uh, not being able to speak today. He's got a bad bout of COVID, which knocked him out. So um, we will do his section of the presentation in the coming uh, weeks or month. Um, so, yeah, keep your eyes open for that. And, um, yeah, thank you and uh, enjoy reading the report. Brilliant. Thanks, Jordan. And thanks so much, everyone, for your time and for coming to support um, Big Trees with us tonight. It was a pleasure to have you all 
And um, thank you again, Jordan. And please make sure next time you are out and about to give your favourite tree a hug next time you see it. Or if you don't have a favourite, give all of the trees um, some love. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Shannon.